If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 35, which uh, we just heard read the first reading today. Uh, we will actually get to um, jump around to uh, both uh, the James reading, James chapter 5, and then we'll talk a little bit about John the Baptist and his, his scenario that we just read about where he's in prison. Um, but before we get there, I want to tell you a story about um, something that happened in January 1990, which is actually the month I was born. Not that that really matters for this man's story, but this was a while ago. Um, January 1990, a pastor named Dwayne Miller got out of bed to preach at the church that he worked at. And he got out of bed and he, said, he had this the little bit of the beginning of, of something that you would, you'd say, like, I'm not sick yet, but just give me till about noon and I will be. That sort of thing where um, it's, it, it's, it's like a cold or something. And he went and he preached the first service. And by the end of that, he, he, the second service, he could barely get through, and then he had an evening thing that he was supposed to do, and it got to the point where he couldn't talk. He was just sick as a dog, and his uh, church said, just go home, rest, get well. He couldn't talk. He, he had like uh, a swollenness in the throat. Well, he, he, after he, he had the flu, he got sicker and sicker. He finally went to the doctor, and uh, his throat was swollen shut. Couldn't, couldn't hardly get a scope down. Um, he, he got on steroids. He got on antibiotics. Um, he had uh, inflammation in his bronchi, and that all cleared up. But then once it cleared up, he still had this pressure in his throat. And when he talked, he sounded like this when he talked. He couldn't speak. Didn't know what was going on. No idea. Doctors couldn't figure it out. He ended up seeing over the next six months, uh, dozens and dozens of specialists couldn't figure it out. His voice wouldn't be restored. No one could figure that out. And then the doctor said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take six months of absolute silence and rest. Go and wait. Six months. After those six months, he came back and um, he went to the doctor. He had made no sound for six months. He came to the doctor, but he knew what was going to happen. The doctor said, all right, let's hear it. And he tried to talk and uh, 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 nothing. He, he still felt this pressure on his windpipe. We'll come back to Dwayne's story in a little bit, but for all of us, there might have been physical injuries, illnesses, um, disease that have struck us or those that we love. Even more than physical ones, we even have um, spiritual impairment and emotional and psychological suffering that happens in this world. And in many cases, there seems to be, just like in Dwayne's case, there seems to be no hope of getting better. There doesn't seem to be a solution in front of us. There's that family member with cancer that comes back with a positive scan. Um, That pain that you've had in your body that won't go away. The habit or addiction that you've not been able to defeat. That sin pattern that you've given up fighting because you think that's just part of who you are now. That anxiety or that depression that just won't improve. Our passage today proclaims the good news that in every circumstance and for every malady, both physical and spiritual, there is healing coming. That's the good news. There is a God who promised not only full restoration, but new creation. But it also presents us with a question that we'll talk about today. That same question that Dwayne Miller had to ask. What do I do when the healing hasn't come yet? When the healing doesn't seem to come, what do I do in the midst of waiting, in the midst of dealing with it, the suffering? Jesus the Messiah is the healer who will one day come to bring healing to the whole world, but bids us wait. So how do we wait with faith? That's the question. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it. Let's look at Isaiah 35. First, we're going to look at the good news. We're going to look at what's proclaimed, and then we're going to transition to talking about how do we wait well. So Isaiah chapter 35, um, and as a chapter, this, this uh, uh, whole passage, verses 1 through 10, proclaim a summary message that actually summarizes, if you go forward and you read really from chapter 40 to the rest of the book, this extended conversation on new creation and on restoration and on uh, everything being made right by the God who comes and visits earth. And we see it kind of in a nutshell here in chapter 35. 
And so it starts out with a general vivid image of that coming day. Look at verse 1. It says, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus or like the lily. And it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy in singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. So the first several lines here are in parallel with, the, uh, with each other. You have the wilderness being glad, the desert being glad, it's blossoming abundantly, it's rejoicing with joy. You have multiple iterations of this poetic imagery of a place where you have um, a death, you have a dryness, you have an arid climate, you have no life seemingly. It starts to come alive, right? The desert wilderness will begin to bloom with beauty and life and will erupt it's this really uh, vivid imagery of it's, it's like a loud shout, an eruption, a breaking out. One of the words there for breaking out with noise is the same word that's used for a breakout of a disease. It's this breaking out with life. It, it, it comes out of a place that's seemingly impossible. Um, it's a metaphor, right? It's saying that all the places where it seemed like there was no life will now be full of life. And places where it was eerily silent, there will be loud celebration with joy and music and dancing. That's what's being talked about here. It says the glory of places like Lebanon and Carmel and Sharon will be given to it. So you have, if you, if you can imagine the geography of, of Palestine and Israel, you have on the one side, I'm, I'm doing it backwards so that hopefully it's the right way with you, you have the uh, Mediterranean Sea and the coastline. And right along the coastline, going from the north, you have uh, Lebanon, right? And you have this luscious land and there's, there's the, in, in the Bible it talks about the cedars of Lebanon, uh, Candace gets really excited about this because she's Lebanese, so she, she says we're in the Bible. So we have the cedars, the, the forests of Lebanon, and then you have um, the mountain area of Carmel, like Mount Carmel, where Elijah did his thing with the fire and the prophets. Look it up. It's a fun story. And uh, that whole mountainous region is, has, has uh, life and vegetation. And then you get down to the plains of Sharon, and you've got, this is actually now one of the most densely populated places in all of Israel, and it's really uh, um, uh, uh, fertile, and it's where they did all their farming, okay? And then you move over, and you have the mountains, and then you start to get into really dry, rocky, deserty terrain, okay? So you have all this glorious, really nice real estate, lakefront property, seafront property, right? That's, that, that's where you'd build, that's where you'd buy your vacation home. All the glory, all the, the fruitfulness, all of that is going to be given to the place where it doesn't exist, where it seems impossible, where actually meteoro meteorologically, however that word should be said, it doesn't happen. It's going to happen. All of what happens for Sharon and Carmel, and, and, or uh, um, Lebanon and Carmel and Sharon, all that's going to be then given to the desert places. So if you didn't know where Sharon, and, I had to do all this geography work this week figure all that out. I didn't know any of that. To figure all that out. This is what we're doing in our office during Monday through Thursday. So this mountainous region where there is little life is going to be bursting with life. Where currently there is terrible soil, it's going to be fertile. This is good news. This is life from the dead. This is not just restoration. This is new creation. This is over and above. So we asked, what about those places in your life where it seems like there is no life? What if you have places in your life, there's people you know, or maybe there's areas of, of physical health or mental emotional health where it's, you're not here on the, on, the, on the seaside. You're over here. And it's just rocky, hot. There's hyenas, jackals. It's not where you'd want to go hang out. It's dry. There is no life. It seems like there's no hope. What do you do if that hasn't happened yet? Well, look at verse three. Look at verse three. Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong. Fear not. Why? Behold, your, your God will come with vengeance. That is against the oppressor. That is against sin. That is against Satan and death. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. In light of the good news, we are called to strengthen our hands and knees. 
This means that we keep on working. That, that means we keep on walking. We keep standing. We don't fall down and give up. We're going to get there. Speak these words to those with anxious hearts. Who has anxious hearts? Who is it? It's those who are waiting and unsure of whether this new creation and restoration will actually come for them. I think that's all of us, actually, at some level. I feel that. We've all felt that. He will come to bring justice and salvation. He will come. James 5 that we just read starts off talking about this. I'm going to, I'd say flip there, but I'm going to scroll there. James 5 starts off, we'll go to it says, be patient, therefore, brothers. Be patient until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits? He says, see how he waits? He doesn't know what's going to happen, but then the rain comes, right? You also be patient. Establish your hearts. Make them firm. Don't waver. Don't be overtaken by what, what seems like an insurmountable uh, problem. Don't be overtaken by what, what seems like an impossible, lifeless terrain. But be patient, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. It's happening. It's going to happen. Consider the blessed uh, Job, who was steadfast and ultimately received the mercy of God. This is what's being asked of us. This is what's being commanded. So when that salvation comes, what's it going to look like? Back to Isaiah. If you look at verse 5, it says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. So there's healing. And we know that in our gospel reading, this actually started to happen in Christ. There's healing. Then look what it says in verse 6. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. So it's not that the lame man just gets up and kind of hobbles home. This isn't just like, Partial healing. This isn't like uh, we kind of got we kind of got the knees back working again. We gotta you know we gotta do some recovery, right? There's there's PT that needs to happen. No, he gets up and he leaps like a deer. I don't know if that's like a ballet leap or if that's like what that looks like. But the lame, the person whose legs didn't work doesn't just get healed, but it's a it's an abundance. It's an over the top. It's an it's new creation. And there's this leaping for joy. Woo! I can walk again. Not just walk, I can dance, I can leap, I can jump. This is great. Okay, and then look right after that. The tongue of the mute singing for joy. Um, I had lots of teachers who wished that I had a mute mouth growing up. <laughs> um, and if you come to my house, uh, my kids are starting to uh, catch the habit, but someone's always whistling. Well, not my wife, but I'm, me or my daughter are always whistling, humming, singing something, switching out words to songs, making stuff up. I got it from my own father. We, we just never stop, right? So imagine like there are people who are really quiet naturally. And then there's people who literally can't speak. And it's not that like now that they can speak, they're like, great, when I need to say something, I'll, I'll say something and I'll really shock them. No, now that I can actually say something, now that I can actually speak, I can't contain it. I'm singing for joy. God has done something great in me. God has restored my ability to speak in a way that was, is, is, is incomprehensible. And so it's an over the top. I can now sing like uh, uh, Celine Dion or I could sing like Luciano Pavarotti. I can, I can let it loose and hit that high B flat. That's what's going to happen. There's a singing for joy because waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. So there's healed bodies. You see this? This imagery is of healed bodies, and that is both literal and metaphorical. Because you see, uh, and the early church was big on this when they interpreted this passage. If you, if you go back and read the commentaries, this is literal, like one day we'll get new bodies. Our eternity is in resurrected, restored bodies, not just floating. Okay, so... Eyes that can see, bodies that can work, voices that work well. We'll all sing together. If you're tone deaf, never fear. It's going to happen, okay? But also, the ability to perceive the sight of the blind, our spiritual senses are awakened to be able to see God properly and see the world around us properly. Our ability to speak well, to speak truth, 
to speak wisdom is restored. Our ability to hear the voice of the Lord and to hear one another is restored. There's spiritual faculties being restored as well as physical faculties. This is what God is doing when he comes to heal all things. This is what Jesus, excuse me, this is what Jesus the healer does. So not only will bodies be healed, but then look at verse, the last half there of verse six. It says, waters break forth in the wilderness, streams in the desert, the burning sand shall become a pool, the thirsty ground springs of water. There's also a healed earth. See this in 2 Peter, it says the earth will be uh, remade by fire, that, that all kind of like when you're uh, purging impurities out of metal, that the impurities will be burned away from the world that uh, uh, everything will be remade and life will be brought forth, just like we saw in that first verse. So we have healed bodies, we have a healed earth, and then we have healed souls. A highway, look at verse 8, a highway will be there called the way of holiness. Not just the way of those who can run fast, not just the way of, you know, I-35 or whatever. This is the way of holiness. It's marked by holiness. He will make a way of return for us. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way, those who follow after Jesus Christ. There's a spiritual restoration that happens. No lion, there's no danger, right? No lion shall be there. No ravenous beast will come upon it. You won't have to worry about getting, getting uh, uh, mauled. You won't have to worry about accidents like I did. Last night I was driving on the freeway in the rain and I was like, what's going to happen? Someone's going to slide off. No, none of that. There's no fear. You just walk with abandon because it is totally safe. The returning way back to God is totally safe. And it says in verse 10, and the ransom that the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away forever. This is the promised healing coming from the hands of Jesus Christ. This is the good news. This is the good news. So, how do we wait for this to happen? Because this is awesome. Sounds great, doesn't it? Does this sound great? This is eternity. This is healed bodies. This is a healed earth. This is healed souls for eternity. How do we wait? I just got to watch Terrence uh, Malick's film, The Tree of Life, from 2011, um, the other night. Um, and the question of loss and grief is, is confronted in that movie. And there's a woman who's lost a, a son to war, and her friend sell, sells her, um, sometimes God sends flies to wounds he should heal. And... Sometimes that's what it feels like. Um, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to even be talking about this in front of people who have gone through way more than I have in this room. Some of you have gone through a lot. And I've, I've had an easy life by comparison. But as a pastor, all I can do is tell you what the Word of God says. And I'm trying to be as real and as honest as I can in the midst of the suffering knowing that my turn is coming one day. None of us are immune to that. And here's what happens. We look in our gospel reading. John the Baptist is in prison. Jesus has arrived. He baptized Jesus and he kicked off Jesus' ministry. John the Baptist is pumped, right? Because you have to remember, so he's thrown into prison. You have to remember this is the one who a literal archangel appears to his dad and says, you're going to have a son and you name him John. That happened, I'm, I'm like trying to figure out how to, what to name my third child. I'd wish an angel would just be like, here you go, here's the name, it's going to be awesome. He's going to be the most important person that's ever lived, Jesus says. Like, great, cool, that's awesome. Like, this is a really important guy. This is, he's preparing the way of the Lord. Like, all that new creation you're thinking about, he's getting that ready. Like, he's part of the highway process. He's laying the groundwork. So when Jesus shows up, he baptizes him. Jesus starts healing people. It's going well. Well, then John, he speaks a little too truthfully to someone with a little bit too much power, and he gets thrown into prison. So John sends his disciples to Jesus and says, after he hears what Jesus has been doing, are you you the one to come? Is it you? Or should we wait for someone else? The only reason I can determine that John would do that after all he's 
done and seen and the stories he's heard from his parents is that the circumstances surrounding him are not anything like what he expected to happen. Some of it is. There's healing happening. He's heard. He's like, this sounds like what we know is coming, but a lot of this doesn't look right. I'm in prison. I thought we were about to take stuff over. The nature of the Messiah's coming is in some ways in line with what he expected, but on the other hand, um, he's about to get beheaded. So he's saying, help me make sense of this, Jesus. And Jesus' answer is very important. Jesus reassures John based on the present deeds and power of God in his midst. Yet, he has not yet, and he does not, usher in the final consummated kingdom of God. So there's reassurance that the real thing is happening now even though the final thing has not happened yet. You catch that? There's reassurance the real thing is happening now. You haven't made a mistake, even though the final thing hasn't happened yet. The Messiah truly is here, and he truly is a healer, and he has come, and he's opening eyes, and he's opening ears, and he's unstopping tongues, and he's making uh, the lame walk and he's casting out demons, and he's raising from the dead. He's healing diseases. He's making clean those who are unclean. And he's casting down the powers and principalities in his life and death. Yet, the fullness hasn't come yet. And ultimately, John the Baptist is beheaded while waiting for the fullness. How do we put those together? I'm stealing unapologetically from Henry Nouwen on this next part where we talk about waiting. It bears saying that we have to wait as we wait for this coming final consummation that we're talking about, this healing. We have to wait. I have a friend who says that of all people, Christians are the people of delayed delayed gratification. Of all people, Christians are the people of delayed gratification. Our endurance, this is what James was just saying, is not optional. It's not an optional addition to being Christian. We don't get to be Christians and and then get to get what we want all the time. Not even in the supernatural realm. Because we're not in control. It's essential to the nature of being Christian to being in between the two comings of Jesus. He has come, this is Advent. He has come and we remember that and he will come. And in the middle, there's a tension and ambiguity of the current reality and the coming finality. There's a tension. We're in a place of waiting. and We may have an exact idea for how we think it's going to be resolved. And so we wish for a specific outcome. It's like when you wish upon a star. It makes no difference who you are. Or you wish when you blow out your birthday candle or you put together a wish list for Christmas, you have a specific Um, present in mind or dream in mind. One way to wait is with a wish. One way to wait is with a wish to say, I wish this outcome would happen and you have a specific outcome in mind. And when you wish with that specific outcome in mind, two things can happen. What are they? First one is you get your wish and you're happy. The second one is you don't get your wish and you're disappointed and bitter. When we wish for a specific outcome to the alleviation of our discomforts, when we wish for a specific outcome for how God will work in our midst, those are the only two two outcomes. And if that's the case, um, if that's the way that we wait, we wait with us in control. We wait on our own terms. We we wait um, um, dictating how things ought to go. Waiting with a wish is one way to do it. The other way to wait is to wait in hope. Hope is open-ended. Hope is open-ended. It does not dictate the outcomes. Now, hope is not shapeless. Hope is not formless. Hope is not abstract and completely without. We have, we have a real true hope for what things are going to look like, don't we? We just talked about it. But hope doesn't, doesn't dictate the exact form in which that comes, the exact timing in which that comes. Hope doesn't dictate those things. It remains open 
ended. Hope leaves control in God's hands and is confident that his timing and his resolution to this waiting period will be the absolute best ever because he is wisest and all good. All of our needs will be satisfied. Will be satisfied. I would venture so far as to say that John the Baptist had both wishes and hopes. This is the, the paradox or the difficulty of being a human. It's not so clean as like, you can only be waiting in hope and only be waiting in wishes. Sometimes it's all mixed up, isn't it? Sometimes we, we are working, we're trying to be open-handed, but we do have things that we really want to happen. We have to hold those loosely. And I think John the Baptist was sitting in prison going, I'm, I'm, so, I'm open to what God's doing. I'm, I'm trying to, to be faithful and to obey, but gosh, this doesn't look like I thought it was gonna look. And so he asked, are you, are you sure? Jesus says, I'm sure. And so he's faithful. When we are sick, either physically, mentally, or spiritually, and we find ourselves in that deep pit, what will we do? How will we wait? Dwayne Miller, the pastor that I told you about, ended up waiting three years. Thought it was over. And um, he was asked at one point to sub for someone's Sunday school class. He went in to teach. And uh, we actually have an audio clip of what, how that class went. He was talking about, um, he was talking about a psalm where it says that he heals all of our diseases. And he has something really powerful to say about um, that. So we have, can we play that video, that clip, please? So when the psalmist writes, and he heals all of my diseases, let me say to you that I believe God still heals. That hasn't ended. That is not over. Now you have to be careful on how you do this because there are folks who carry things to an excess and it becomes a show. And God has never intended that that be what it is. God heals in his sovereign will. I don't know why God does things that he does, but I know that he does. And the only thing he requires of me is to allow him to be God and me to be me and let it be. To say that every single person will always be healed because Jesus died on the cross is a misinterpretation of scripture. Not true. Won't work. Isaiah 53 doesn't talk about physical healing. I'm sorry. That's just not the context. And to impress that there causes a misinterpretation of Scripture. That's wrong. On the other hand, to say that, since we don't have anything after the book of Acts, that miracles ended at the book of Acts and they never happen again, is equally as wrong. Because you have put God in a box both ways. And he doesn't want to be in the box. So, the psalmist says, I'm excited. Bless the Lord, O my soul. One of his benefits is he heals all of my diseases. And in verse 4, he says, and he redeems my life from the pit. Now, I like that verse just a whole lot. I have had, and you have had in times past, pit experiences. <sighs> We've both had, we've all had times when our life seemed to be in a pit, in a grave. And we didn't have an answer for the pit we find ourselves in. <sighs> And I don't understand this right now. I'm but overwhelmed at the moment. You can stop it there. So in the middle of teaching, Dwayne Miller's uh, voice was healed. In the middle of teaching, when he said he redeems my life from the pit, he says he felt that pressure that he'd had for three years that no one could figure out, it let go. And God healed him. Um, so you can look this up. Dwayne, he's, he's, he's written a memoir about this. Um, he's been 
uh, you know, his doctors have been talked to. It's like, yeah, this was a real thing, and he just was miraculously healed. And this is one of, I mean, we could, I'm sure we could tell stories, people we know, stories we've heard, um, that God enters in and in the midst of, he's, he's saying the exact thing, that we can't put God in this box, that he's always going to heal and that he's never going to heal, but there's this weird uh, in-between time where we're between the two advents where um, the reality is here and the finality is coming. And so today, we're going to do what James 5 tells us to do, and we're going to pray. We're going to pray for healing. We're going to do that today. Um, if that makes you uncomfortable, um, it's in the Bible, and we're just going to do it. So the way we're going to do that, though, is uh, in an orderly fashion. We're going to do that uh, just in the midst of our liturgy, and there's a couple of options for ways that you can receive healing for prayer. And we're going to ask expectantly and hopefully for God to heal in our midst. Um, first is, um, we do this every week, that we have a prayer team that meets in the back, and and they are equipped and ready to pray for healing for specific things in your life. Um, I would encourage you to take advantage of that today. If you have something that's uh, maybe of a, a, a medium level of involvement, right? Um, you can kind of tell the story quickly and you can receive uh, healing there. Um, also, in communion uh, line today, if as you're coming up and receiving communion, if there's something that's, that's relatively brief, that's, um, you know, pain or, or phys- uh, mental or emotional or physical uh, pain that has, hasn't gone away, just tell us and we can, we'll pray for you right here at the front of the line if uh, you want to do that as you're receiving communion. Um, another option that I'm going to make myself available um, in two ways. First, right after service, I'll come over here in, in this corner and I'll wait. And if you want to come to me and, and tell me something um, more in depth, um, I have oil that we have been given as a, a part of healing and we'll, I'll anoint you with oil and I'll pray for specific healing for something that's maybe more in depth, uh, something that uh, is affecting you either spiritually, emotionally, or, or, or bodily. Um, and then if, if that even isn't enough and you need more time, uh, please reach out to me and, and con- contact me and I would love to schedule extended time with you to, um, to, to hear your story, to hear what's going on, and to pray for healing and for restoration in your life. Um, we are called to pursue this and to ask Jesus to be who he says he is, which is the healer, the one who brings life out of death. And we'll do this not just for our own benefit, we do this for the glory of God. We do this for the glory of God. Amen.